Hi, everybody. My name is Andreas. I'm super excited to be presenting for a second year in a row in our Congress. So thank you so much for having me. This year, uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that is really dear uh, to me, and it's about mental health. More specifically, we will be talking about how we can foster mental health in our sport organizations, specifically through mental toughness. Per request of the organizers, there we go. Uh, I included a short bio. So you can see where I got my PhD. Um, I work for SUNY Plattsburgh, the State University of New York. I'm an associate professor, the coordinator of the undergrad program and the lab director. Obviously my research interests, if you haven't realized it already, is Fortaleza Mental. I have several, I, I am certified through several organizations. I'm from Greece. And a couple of uh, important things to share here. I'm a fellow for ACSM, and I'm also the president of the Greater New York ACSM chapter, along with a couple more things. Now, this is what I'm going to try to prove to you today. And as you're reading all these things, uh, I want you to uh, excuse me if I have mistakes uh, in Spanish, typos, but I try to um, be more considerate. And so I'm speaking in English, but I, I try to have as much of my slideshow in Spanish to facilitate uh, those that do not understand English or not, they can speak uh, very well. So again, as you're reading all this, I want you to think about your sport organization, and no matter if it is um, governmental, state, or profit, or non-profit, if it has to do with sports, whatever we say today, uh, it will have a high degree of applicability. So let's start. In general, in general, mental well-being, and I'm using a specific uh, paradigm of wellness here that has six components. You can use one with eight components, with 12 components. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that mental well-being is strongly related to our occupational performance, whether you are an athlete or not. And that's why through organizational psychology, there has been an intentional effort to include mental health as part of general organizational practices when we're talking about occupational performance. However, when it comes to the sports industry, mental health has had not attracted attention until very recently. And that doesn't make a lot of sense, even if we consider two things, the stressors and the barriers. So, we know that athletes, when we consider them as employees, they have on average more stressors. For example, they can have injuries, but they can keep them away or terminate their career. They, are, they have a lot of criticism depending uh, on, on their job and on their performance that no other employees have so much. Think about you know, media and social media more specifically. And at the same time, there are a lot of barriers. So it has been very difficult for a lot of people to understand how an athlete that has that physicality, that prowess, can at the same time be sensitive. So it is hard for some people to understand or capture in their head the meaning of vulnerability in a sports setting. So there has been stigma. There has been a lot of stigma in terms of mental health 
in sports. Lately, uh, attitudes of people have changed. And in that, we had a lot of help by those big names that came out and talked about it, and also from some official reports. So here we have some recent examples. Here we have Kevin Love, uh, who's an NBA player, who was one of the first who came out and talked about, as you can see, stigma and how hyper masculinity. Michael Phelps has talked a lot about mental health issues that really have helped. And I don't know if you remember Simone Biles and the Tokyo Olympics, what happened there. That helped a lot, raise awareness. And this is again, something very uh, recent. We see here as uh, Stephen Curry that talks about Naomi, Zaka. And I don't, I don't know if you remember what happened in the French Open. And he's trying to explain that when they saw that, they made his own team really talk about mental health. So all these have helped tremendously and we're very grateful for all these big athletes that are raising the awareness. And in order for all of us to understand that each one of us is contributing to mental health, whether we want it or not. Now, we also have, regardless, and especially in the NCAA, the collegiate level here in the United States, we had a lot of um, events like the one that you just see, uh, tragic events that really shook the whole um, association. Also, we had reports, that's a very recent report from May that shows that we knew that we already had issues before COVID. And now this one shows that post COVID, the mental health issues or concerns of our student athletes, let's say um, concerning mental exhaustion, anxiety, depression, they're one and a half to two times higher. So as you're looking at all this, I want you again to think about your organization. Uh, and I think we made a case on why athletes may have definitely have needs and may have higher needs in terms of mental health. So if that is not something that your organization is supporting, think who is the one that limits that? What limits the support of mental health in your, your organization? Are there individuals, are there teams, or are there organizational structures? Now, what is mental health? Let's talk about that. There are several definitions, and here we see the one from uh, uh, World Health Organization. No matter which definition you like more, what is important here to solidify is an understanding of mental health and mental illness. We used to think that they are the extreme sides of the same continuum. So mental health is here and mental illness, let's say it's here. Lately, we have moved from that paradigm and we have shifted in a paradigm that we say that we have mental health in one continuum and mental illness in another continuum. And those intercept in a way. So what we're trying to say here is we don't think they're parts of the same continuum, but there are two different continuum that intercept. Example, we have people who have been diagnosed, let's say with depression, but still they function very well in society, right? At the same time, we have people who have never been diagnosed with a mental illness. However, there are times that maybe they are drinking a little bit more, they have issues with sleep, they have anxiety and depression. So what we need to understand here, no matter which definition we adopt, is that we can be both and our athletes can be both. Here I have some examples that will help us understand a little bit more. 
uh, we have mental health, mental like positive outcomes of mental health um, and negative outcomes, let's say mental illness. So you see some examples here, like happiness, stress, depression, the social acceptance, uh, insomnia, and so on and so forth. Those are some examples to think as we're moving forward uh, with this presentation. Now, how can we foster mental health in our organization? One way to see this is to break it down into three levels, the individual level, the team level, and the organizational level. So first of all, one thing we can do is start from the individual and see uh, what kind of mental health needs they have. Then we can move to the second level or layer, team. Here, we need to see how we can create a team environment that is supportive of the mental health needs of all of the team members. And on the third level, what we do is we we'll have that leadership and that communication that you see, and we we'll create, we we'll develop those policies and programs that support the first two levels. So that's one way to see it. So we talked about organizational psychology before. So we take this structure, um, this systems approach, as we say, from organizational psychology, and we bring it into sports psychology, and we have organizational sports psychology. So we take that um, systems approach, and we apply it to our sport organization. Let's get a little bit more specific. How can we do it? So as you can see here, first of all, we have to create a vision that includes mental health. After we do that, we have to assess the readiness of our organization and see if we're ready to do something like that and what do we need. Then talk with the people that we need to talk and gain commitment from all kinds of levels of people. And then if that's accomplished, we need to assess the mental health of our organization so we see exactly what kind of needs we have and where we stand right now. After that, we can move on and design and implement programs that have to do with mental health. And based on the pyramid that I just showed you, first we educate and we take care of the individual, and then we go to the team, and then we go to the policies on the organizational level. Of course, at the very end, we should not forget to do to evaluate our success. And that shows us that this kind of process in our sport organization never ends. It's a continuous process. So if you commit towards something like that, it's not that you do it once and it's over. On the contrary, we need to evaluate and restart the whole process and make it better. Now, for, um, for today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on educating the individual and the team, and we're gonna use mental toughness. Are you ready? All right, let's go. So what is mental toughness, or why mental toughness actually at this point? Well, mental toughness, can buffer the effects of adversity and therefore minimize negative mental health outcomes and promote positive mental health outcomes. Also, the fact that we call it mental toughness and on mental health as an intervention or as a program, it sounds better because we're trying to avoid the stigma and go around it. So it is, it is a kind of training that does not carry any stigma with it. So, people uh, accept it easier, and we have higher levels of adherence into these kind of programs. And the third one, which is really important, um, mental toughness is not something that is something that we learn and we can apply just in sports, right? It transfers to everything, to our um, occupational life, to our social life, to any other aspect of our life. So that's why we are doing this kind of training and this kind of presentation tonight uh, about mental toughness and how we can use mental toughness 
to reach mental health. All right, what is it? Fortaleza Mental, what is it? So as you can see um, at the bottom of that figure, um, I have put a definition in general, in, in the most simplistic way, uh, let's say you are at point A and you wanna go at point B, as you're going from point A to point B, there are always gonna be some kind of obstacles, right? What mental toughness does for us is give us the skills to face that adversity so we can keep moving towards our goal and actually achieve it. That's the simplest way I can put it. Now, as you can also see, there are eight components, right? Self-efficacy, emotional regulation, buoyancy, and so on and so forth. Uh, in this kind of model, all of these assimilate over time and they become that one thing that is called mental toughness. How do they do that? Well, as you can see, they have three characteristics that, they're all, that are common in all eight key dimensions. They're purposeful, so they help us towards our purpose, towards our goal. They're flexible, so we can use them in, in a flexible way depending on what kind of adversity we have. And also they're efficient, which means with the same resources, we can achieve more results. So these are the three characteristics that are common in all three of them. And over time, if we have all of them, they assimilate and we have mental toughness. Based on this model, what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you a way in how we break it down and try to teach you because all of these are skills and that's very important, they're taught, they can be taught uh, to have mental toughness. And uh, therefore, as you're reaching your goals because we all have goals and at the same time, as we're trying to achieve our goals, we're all gonna face some kind of obstacles to have less stress and more happiness, okay? Before I move any further, I wanna show you this questionnaire. This is the mental toughness index. Um, the Escala de Fortaleza Mental. And we have already done the work. We have published this paper. So we have the questionnaire translated in Spanish. Uh, so if anybody is interested in using that questionnaire in um, any kind of research, um, this is where you can find it and it's free and it's available. Also, you can contact me and I can help you with any kind of questions. That's how, what we use, for example, to prove or to evaluate our programs, our mental toughness programs. Okay, this is the question that, for example, we'll give before intervention, during the intervention, and obviously after the intervention. So each one of those questions represent one of those key dimensions. So for example, the first one is about self-efficacy. And the last one is about optimism. And having said that, let's start and explain what is optimism and how that it can help somebody have more mental health outcomes and less, fewer um, positive, have more positive mental health outcomes and fewer um, mental health, negative mental health outcomes. All right, optimism. Optimism is, and I'm sure you know people in your life that are optimists or pessimists. Optim an optimist expects positive events in their lives and also attribute positive causes and outcomes to whatever um, different events happen in their lives. So here I have a figure, the sun versus the rain, and I can share a very short story about a player that I used to work with. Um, we'll call him Liam. He was a hockey player and he was recruited um, as a very good player, but later on, he wasn't playing very well. He, he felt helpless. Um, he felt um, that he wasn't doing well and he came to me to talk. So, what we identified is that when he would do a mistake, he would take it personally. 
And he would think, for example, that the whole game then would go bad. And not only that, he would think that his whole day will go bad. So not only will be a bad athlete, but also he could be an, a bad student. One way to teach somebody optimism is use the three P, personal, permanent, pervasive. That's called the explanatory style. And what it says is that no matter what happens to us, it's uh, more about how we filter it and how we explain it than the actual event. First of all, before we even start, we know that positive people live healthier and longer lives. And also we know that on average, we want to be around more, we want to be around more positive people, optimist people, optimists than pessimists, right? So in this example, we can teach ourselves and our athletes not to take it personally, not to think something is permanent and not to think that something will spill over the rest of the day or the week or whatever. So in, in this case for Liam, we created three phrases uh, so he doesn't have the negative self-talk whenever he would do a mistake because mistakes will happen, okay? The thing is that whatever events happen to our lives, we should expect positive events. And when something happens, we should attribute more positive causes than negative causes. So in this case, he would say something that the past wasn't that good. So it wasn't my fault. I'll get it next time. And because Liam really wanted not to disappoint his father, we, we added that third sentence about being a great son. So again, the explanatory style, the filter that we use for whatever life brings us is something that we can teach to people. Therefore, optimism is a skill that can lead us to more happiness and less anxiety and depression. The second one, emotional regulation. So first of all, uh, what we are gonna talk about here is to be aware of your emotions first and then have an ability. Again, it's an, it's an ability, therefore we can develop it, which means somebody can teach it to us or we can teach it to ourselves. To use whatever is relevant emotionally, in order to facilitate our performance and that attainment of whatever goal we have. So here, what we need to understand and how this can help us towards more mental toughness and mental health is that first of all, we need a situation that matters to us, right? Let's say it's about our sport or whatever, that matters to us. Something happens and because it matters to us, it draws our attention, okay? then we have to kind of evaluate the situation. So that is the appraisal part. So during that appraisal part, we'll evaluate as positive or negative or whatever, and that will initiate a response. And that response, as you can see, goes back to the situation and affects the whole situation. A classic example that I usually use is the flat tire. So it's Monday morning, you try to go to work, and you have flat tire. You can deal with that in basically two ways. You can start cussing, kicking the tire, start saying things like, why me? I knew it would be me. Everything bad happens to me. My whole day will be bad and I knew it. Or you can get disappointed. You know, we can get upset for two or three minutes and then just change the tire, smile, understand that this is a random event that has nothing to do with anything else and go to work. One important thing that I want to talk about right now here, and I was talking to our volleyball players because I did an intervention uh, this week, is that my emotions and my mood affects others. And we all need to understand that. that and I was telling our volleyball students, athletes, that even if you want to be selfish enough and be in a bad mood, you cannot do it in a team environment because it will 
rub off into others. So if you're in a bad mood, then probably I'll be a little in, a, in more of a bad mood and then the next person and then the next person. So stop it, block it, change the narrative, smile, transmit positivity, positive emotions, not negative emotions, because as you can see, it comes back into the situation and affects everything. The same into a sport as you're playing. So that is really important. Now, how can we regulate our emotions and how can others, how can we teach them to regulate their emotions? There are basically five ways that I put over here just to um, help us a little bit kind of group everything. The first two are before. The last two can be used after the event. And the third one is somewhere during the event. So first of all, if we know that something will put us in a bad mood or stress us out and we can avoid it, avoid it. If you know that going into this room and finding these people and talking about a thing will really affect your mood negatively and you can avoid that, that's the best thing you can do, being proactive, okay? The second thing is if you can modify the situation, a lot of times something happens and we can just do an easy fix, all right? So it's, it's snowing and your car doesn't start, but your roommate or your cousin or your friend can come pick you up and take you to work and you won't be late. If you can modify the situation automatically, you are, you are ha you're having that ability to uh, regulate your emotions uh, during that event. Number three is about um, attentional deployment. So let's say you are playing a game of soccer and you're losing 2-0 and it's halftime. You go into the locker room and the coach is trying to distract you in a good way and remind you how good you are and what you've done in the past in order to change your emotion, to change, to shift your mood so you feel better and you play better. The, the last two is after the event had happened. Let's say you lost the game. You lost the match, okay? You can say, I didn't lose, I learned. So a lot of times you can say that it's not that, you can take something positive out of every situation. So that cognitive change to change the way you think about a phenomenon, a, a, a phenomenon that may seem negative and use it in a positive way, that's a huge shift that will affect your mood. And again, it's something that can be taught. The last one is the response. A lot of people, when they are in a bad mood, um, they do things that we do not approve, such as drinking a lot or eating a lot, bad food. We can teach people that it's okay to have a response to that, but it could be healthier. Go for a walk. Meditate. Do some relaxation techniques. So all these five ways can really help us regulate the emotions before, during, and after an event and lead us to more positive and fewer negative uh, mental health outcomes. Let's go to the next one. Attention regulation. Attention obviously is to um, has to do with focusing on what is relevant to our goal and block anything else that is irrelevant. And here, in order to explain that, we will use executive functioning and we will use it um, in the process of decision making. So when you're making some decisions, there are mainly four things. The first one is identifying the problem and describing it very well and find solutions, identify solutions. So during that part, attention is very important. You have to be attentive. The sooner you realize the problem and the more you pay attention, the more details you have. So the better you can describe it and the better and the more solutions you can have to choose. In the second stage, it does, it's not more, it's not so much about attention. You pick the best one and you plan it. In the third stage, in the execution, you see the intending and the rule use, uh, which means uh, 
actually doing it and the process of doing it. In the process of doing it, attention is very important. And I want you to think about a lot of examples that you starting working on your computer and you start surfing on the internet and then an hour later, like what I was doing. Uh, or you start playing with your phone and they're like, oh my God, what I was doing, right? Or you start running and for some period, if you're doing a long distance, you know, you, you start daydreaming and your pace gets slower and then you just kind of wake up you're like, oh my God. So attention is very important in this during games, during practice, during whatever projects you have to do. Whenever you sit down to do it, if you are, your attention is there, you'll do more in less time, you'll be more efficient and therefore you have less stress and again, more happiness. And in the last one, after you do what you need to do to solve your problem, you have to do that uh, evaluation. And again, attention is very important. You have first to detect the problem and then correct it. Obviously detect before correct. Attention again is very important. The more attentive you are, the sooner you identify an error and the more solutions you have to correct it. So this is again an example to teach people how to use attention in order to be more mentally healthy. All right, we're moving along. Hang in there with me. There's another skill that has to do with mental toughness, buoyancy. We call buoyancy the everyday resilience. Let me explain. Buoyancy is a lot about proactiveness. So in this table that I created, you can see the difference between buoyancy and resilience or resiliency. Buoyancy is about minor events that happen very often to most of us. And resilience is more about major events that don't happen not so often and not to all of us. Let me use an example. Uh, and if you, let's say you have an Achilles tendon, and it's torn, all right? That is something that is irregular and doesn't happen to a lot of people and it can create major adversity, okay? Let me give an example that has to do with buoyancy. Um, being stressed every day uh, about being late to work or to practice. So what we're trying to teach here is that the more you are focusing on buoyancy, the less you have to focus on resilience. What do I mean? If we attack little issues every day, we won't have to attack the bigger issue that builds up later on. For example, if again, I'm getting stressed every day about being late for practice in the morning, one thing we can teach people to decrease their stress levels is prepare your bags from the night before. Okay? Also, um, we can use several examples, uh, but what we need to remember here is that we don't really want to use resilience skills if you don't, if we don't have to. So, if we have that ability to execute those skills, um, when we have challenges in the everyday life, that's great because we will not need as much the ability to execute the required skills to the to bigger challenges. All right, success mindset. Here we're talking about the desire to achieve success and the ability to act upon it. So one theory to explain how success mindset can help you uh, to more towards mental health is the theory of grit. And I created this uh, graph for you. So if what really regulates achievement is talent and effort, what we can really control is effort. So in terms of effort, there are three main things, intensity, direction, and duration. Intensity is something that we can easily detect. We go to the gym and we see somebody being uh, super intense in their workouts, okay? Now, the duration of that intensity for how long they're doing, usually we don't see them. 
what grit is trying to say is that life is like a marathon. That's why I have the uh, marathon in Paris behind it. Um, and in marathon, marathons as in life, the most important skill is stamina because it has to do with a long duration. So grit uh, theory is trying to shift our attention from intensity to direction and duration. And by direction, we mean um, when you put all your effort in fewer things, the higher the achievement on those things. And also the longer you're doing it, the, your, the higher your achievement. So here, what we're trying to teach people, especially younger athletes in, um, in this era of t TikTok and Instagram, uh, they're trying to, be to become an overnight success, uh, is that duration plays a very important role so we have to be super patient during that process. It's going to be a long process to achieve our goals. Again, to give another example, if you're still not uh, persuaded that grid is important, IQ is the metric that we have to measure uh, the talent of intelligence. Grit is not correlated to IQ. Uh, we know that people who have higher levels of grit have high levels of education. And we also know that grit has a higher correlation with success than IQ. So what we're telling people here is that even if you don't have the talents, the talent is not the biggest predictor of success. What is the biggest predictor of success is your effort. And the more you try, the more you're gonna achieve and therefore more happiness, less stress. Context knowledge. So here we need to understand that whatever knowledge we have, it is very important to see the context that we, we are applying it. And that will really affect our performance and therefore mental health outcomes. So here there are two things. If you go to the first pyramid from the left, we need to teach people to understand that whatever knowledge you have in order to be successful, you need to understand your goals, the goals of your team, if you are in a team, most of us are, and then the goals of other units around your life, like your family, for example. And you have to balance. The key word here is balance, right? Um, this is the wisdom theory that we're using to prove that context knowledge is important. And in this wisdom theory, balance is the key word. And as you see in that first pyramid, you have to balance how you use that knowledge and in between the interests that you have, that your team has, and other units in your life, as I said, your family. And then also there's another kind of balance that happens in the second from the left pyramid. There, as you're entering a team, as you're entering um, your, your, the, the team of your sport, there are three things that will happen. You're either going to adapt to that team, to that culture, and use your knowledge like that. You're either going to try to shape the team according to your interests, or you're going um, you're gonna to go to selection and choose another team and be like this, I cannot... I cannot be in this context because it doesn't represent me. So I cannot be happy here. I need to leave and go somewhere else. So what we're trying to teach people here is understand that whatever knowledge you have or whatever you want to do, you need to balance your interests with your team interests and other units in your life. And again, when you're entering a team, uh, there are three, 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 three things that are going to happen and you need to choose how to apply your knowledge in that context. You're either gonna try to, you're either gonna um, adapt to that context, you're either gonna try to shape that context to your interest or find another context because you're stressed and depressed in this, in this team, for example. Again, everything that we've been saying so far are skills and we have two more things to talk about. And what we're trying to prove here, make a case that if you have mental toughness, you have the skills to face the adversity as you're going from point A to point B to your goal. And therefore, 
um, you are more mentally healthy and less mentally ill. Self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the belief in your abilities that you will achieve success in whatever you're doing, in whatever sport you're doing. And on the left side, uh, there are things that we can do to increase our own efficacy or our athletes' efficacy. First of all, we call it mastery experience. So success breeds success. The more successful you are, the higher your self, uh, the higher the levels of your self-efficacy. And that's why, for example, we tell coaches in the beginning of the season, don't play a hard opponent if you can, like in preseason as a friendly match. Start going up slowly in terms of difficulty level because you don't want to start losing in the beginning of the season. That will affect your self-efficacy. And I hope that makes sense. Then we have vicarious experience. And in vicarious experience, what is going on is that I have self high levels of self-efficacy because I see others that are like me. And because they did it, I think I can do it. And of course, the higher the similarity, the better. So if I know somebody from the same town with the same characteristics, from the same socioeconomic background that made it, I feel like I can make it. Also, if this team uh, beat that opponent last year with similar kind of players, this team also can uh, increase their self-efficacy thinking about a year ago or two years ago about the team the way it was. Social persuasion, that's classic when we are doing with the coach, meaning that your coach, the things that your coach or your teacher will tell you will really affect your self-efficacy. You can really uh, take it to a high level or to a really low level, right? Depending on how you talk to your athletes and to yourself. But in here, we talk more about that. A lot, uh, the classic example is, you know, the coach that kind of tries to psych up his or her team right before a match. And the last one is the affective and physiological states. So in order to develop self-efficacy, those butterflies, that arousal that you feel before a challenge and adversity a game uh, should be taken in a positive way. It, that is facilitative more than debilitative, meaning that it's your body telling you, you're ready, let's go, instead of your body telling you, oh my God, this is gonna be very stressful, just go hide, you're not gonna do it. Those are four examples, four sources of self-efficacy that we can teach our athletes. Now, why would we do that? Let's see what happens if you have high levels of self-efficacy. First of all, your thought process is being affected in a positive way. People who have high levels of self-efficacy, which means they really believe in their, their abilities to be successful, they will really think about having a goal and developing a plan to uh, reach that goal compared to other people who have low levels of self-efficacy. The motivation is going to be different. If I really believe that I can make that shot in basketball, I will be uh, way more motivated to actually take that shot compared to if I had low levels of self-efficacy. Affected. Here, also, I take, uh, I see the emotions that I feel, um, whether I lose or win in a more positive way. And the last one, if I have high levels of self-efficacy, I'm going to select more goals and more challenging goals. And we give an example with high achievers. High achievers who usually have high self-efficacy are going to pick the higher mountain. They're going to pick the harder goal because they believe in themselves. And again, this is something that we can teach people and eventually affect their mental health levels. The last thing, but um, not least for sure, let's talk a little bit about adversity. Why would we talk about adversity? Well, the more we know about it, the more we can prepare and the more the better we can face it. So in this presentation, we're talking about major life events. And major life events can be stressful or non-stressful. Obviously, we're talking about major life events that are stressful 
and more specifically, they're, self they're stressful in terms of health because they can be in terms of social life or work. So here, because we're talking about sports, we're just going to talk about health. And all this information that we're going to cover right now, uh, there are 10, let's say, fun facts that come from 70 years of research on adversity. And again, the more we know adversity, the less stress we'll have and more happiness towards it. Because we, if we understand what it is, we can figure ways to actually reach our goal. All right, first of all, the definition. What is adversity? There are many different types of definition uh, concerning that. First of all, um, adversity can be considered anything that is harmful. Another definition can be anything that is um, changing your goals. And under that category, a lot of times, positive events can be stressful. Like when you get that job, you really love that. Or, or when you go to that team, to that club that you really love to, and you moved up, but now you have actually to do what you need to do in that better, let's say, soccer club or basketball club. So that can be stressful as well. So a positive event can also be stressful. And the other thing about the definition is the comparison of what I have and what is needed. So the comparison of resource, resources versus demands. And here we teach people that if you can affect your resources, that's a good thing. Or if you can affect the demands of the event, that's a good thing. Because if you bring them closer and you actually have what is needed, so your resources are more than your demands, then it's not stressful anymore. So again, this is very helpful in terms of mental health. And again, all these are skills that we are teaching people. And actually our intervention has been uh, proven very, very efficient. And that's why I'm sharing it with you today because I do believe that it will help you and your organization. Let's go to the next one, impact on disease. We know it's a fact, many years of research, a lot of data, um, very strong evidence that people who are more stressed um, have more diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases, infectious diseases, and cancer. So, have that in mind. Resilience to stress. So a lot of things can happen to a lot of people, but they don't really, all of us, we don't really, all of us uh, react the same. So there are personal characteristics, such as mental toughness, that affect the way you react to something that happens to you, okay? So that's why we're trying to teach mental toughness, because if you have mental toughness, you will react in a much more positive way to the same adversity and therefore uh, have more mental health and less mental illness. Randomness. If you really, really think about it, adversity is rarely random. So if you need, if you go to the dentist, and you get the bad news that two of your teeth are bad, that didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen overnight. Let's say you weren't brushing enough for months, or if I gained 50 pounds and all of a sudden I'm stressed, that didn't happen overnight. I was gaining pounds and weight every day. Or if I go to the doctor and I've been a smoker for 10 years and they tell me, look, your lungs do not look well. Again, I've been smoking for all these years, right? The same thing with maybe your performance in a game. You didn't play well. Well, did you sleep well this week? Have you been sleeping well? Have you been hydrating? Have you been eating your meals? Have you been um, practicing intentionally? Have you been recuperating after practice? Have you been doing the things that you should do? Whatever you do, ice bath, sauna, whatever. No. Well, see, that's exactly my point that that adversity that you had to face, it wasn't really random. So what we're trying to teach people is if you are proactive, 
and that kind of overlaps with a lot of things that we've said today, such as buoyancy, you can really avoid a lot of stress in your life, a lot of adversity. The next thing is disease and healthy people. We don't, we do not have evidence to say that stress creates disease. What we, what we can say is that somebody who already has a disease and they're not in an equilibrium, if they get stressed, then it pushes them to the other side. That's what we can say. So we do not say that stress or adversity uh, creates um, disease. Now, potency based on type. Excuse me, what we say here and it's proven is if some kind of adversity really affects your core values, let's say, again, I have an issue with my Achilles and I have to retire. And one of my core identities is an athlete that will really affect me. That would be really very stressful, okay? So again, when we have people around us that we see that they're going through something that really attacks their core identity, we should support them socially, for example. So again, uh, again, it's, it's, these are things that we can teach people. Chronic versus acute stressful events. So obviously a chronic event uh, can have um, more side, side effects to a person because it will wear you down eventually or it will catch you off balance, as we said, off your equilibrium a little bit eventually. And statistically speaking, at some point, it will just push you more towards disease, uh, physical and mental. Um, also, we have some kind of events that are reoccurring, like an injury that comes and goes all the time. That's an interesting thing to consider in terms of adversity. And another point I want to make here, and we want to kind of raise awareness when we talk to our athletes, is that, yes, you may have an acute event, but if the side effects are chronic, again, an ACL tour, right? Chronic side effects. That can really affect you. So, again, we need to consider um, the chronic and the acute events and their, their impact. Multiple versus individual events. What we say usually here is obviously multiple may have uh, more side effects, stressful side effects on the individual. And when we say multiple, there are things that can happen at the same time, meaning I lost my job and I moved to another city, or they can be in sequence, meaning I lost my job, which uh, led me to a divorce, which led me to move to another city, which led me to alcoholism, which led me to, let's say, chronic kidney disease. So multiple usually, on average, have more side effects than individual. Timing. Timing is important when we talk about adversity because, for example, we're all gonna lose our parents. But it's very different if you lose your parents when you're 62 compared to when you are two years old. It has a very different effect. In terms of sports, for example, let's say you're playing soccer and you kick 50 penalties and you miss only one. It's very different if you miss the 50th penalty, the last one, compared to the first one. The first one may affect you very, very differently for the rest, okay? So again, timing, when something happens, is very important. And sex differences. In terms of sex differences, uh, we know that based on how society is uh, organized, there is there are difference between the two sexes. So usually men are gonna face stressful events that have to do with uh, achievement when women have to do with more interpersonal events. Um, a great example of differences between the two sexes is um, the, the risk for depression. Women have a higher risk for depression and that's something that we should know and take into consideration uh, when we are um, coaching female athletes. All right, so what can you do? First of all, 
you start with something like this. We all need to educate ourselves. And first of all, comprehend that taking care of yourself mentally is an obligation, a professional obligation. You have to be mentally well, and you have to take the measures that need to be done, first of all, for yourself, and then for everybody else. Then we need to keep doing what all these big names did, uh, promote mental health sensitivity, promote mental health awareness in your team culture. So if you're a coach, let your players know, let your athletes know that it's okay to be vulnerable. And it's not only okay, it's okay to share it with you. And then after they share it, you shouldn't be negative about it. On the contrary, you should help them as much as you can. For example, pointing at where there are resources, let's say on campus or whatever in your organization, that they can go and seek for help. Okay, you should participate in any kind of initiation and development of mental health programs and services. However, mind your scope. What does that mean? That means that, especially in terms of uh, services or programs, there are things that we can do and there are things that a psychologist, for example, could do. If it's out of scope, do not do it. Just refer your athlete to the right professional or the right program. And at the end, understand, and I hope you have already understood that, that fostering mental health, even through a mental toughness in, initiative program, it's, it, it includes all kinds of levels, all kinds of disciplines, and it's a continuous effort. It never stops. So. All the levels of your organization, from the individual to the team to the organizational level, all the disciplines, athletes, managers, coaches, doctors, all of us, all of us should be contributors to mental health. And that never stops because whatever you start doing, you also have to evaluate it and do more programs and do it better and go on again and again and again. I hope I proved my points. Uh, during this conversation. I appreciate you. Uh, it's almost an hour. That's my time. Thank you very much. If you have any questions or anything and you would like to connect, these are my social media handles and two of my uh, email addresses. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I hope to see you again next year. And again, uh, if you have any questions, or if you want to collaborate on some kind of research, please do not hesitate to contact me. Bye.